Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on mining tailings dam collapses in Canada and Brazil. My name is Vanessa. Uh, I am a Humber postgraduate student uh, completing my placement with Kairos, and I will be your facilitator this afternoon. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am standing in the city known as Tegaranto to deliver this opening for you today, and that I and the Kairos Toronto office are on the traditional territory of the Huron Wendon, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous peoples. I further acknowledge the work, knowledge, and experience of Indigenous women land defenders who are often leaders in the protection of Mother Earth, not just in Turtle Island, but across the globe. For your information, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available uh, in the coming days on the Kairos website. I encourage you to use the Q&A, chat, and windows as needed. All the questions to our panelists should be posted in the Q&A um, window. For your information, there will be two Q&A sessions, so please post your questions uh, as they arise. And if you could also please type them in Portuguese, that would be helpful for Daniela. Uh, for those who don't know, May is a uh, month of action for mining justice. This webinar uh, was planned by Kairos to close out the month and transition into June. June is Indigenous Women's Month at Kairos. Uh, this webinar is the first in the series of four webinars that Kairos is organizing or co-sponsoring during the next few weeks uh, on and with women land defenders. The webinar series called Mother Earth and Resource Extraction focuses on women's roles in the protection of land and water, inclusive of gendered impacts and resource extraction. The webinar series is also leading up to the launch of the Canadian phase of the MIR hub, a living digital hub created for and in consultation with women land defenders from across the globe. This past November, Kairos launched the first phase of MIRHUB, which highlighted Latin America. Like the first phase, the Canadian phase will highlight the role of women land defenders in protecting Mother Earth, as well as include links to maps, campaigns, guides, toolkits, and other published documents for and on land and water protection. Today's webinar on tailings dam collapses will draw links between Canada and Brazil. And we have uh, the honor to have today Judith Marshall and Daniela Campolino, uh, who are both experts on the topic. So Judith Marshall, she spent uh, the 1970s in Southern Africa liberation solidarity activities in Toronto and worked in literacy campaigns in Mozambique in the 1980s. In the 1990s, she embarked on a 20-year stint in the Global Affairs Department of the Steelworkers Union. She has written many articles on mining, including recent comparative studies of mine tailings dam collapses in Canada and Brazil. Daniela Campolino lives in a mining community located between the two biggest tailings dam collapses in the Americas, uh, Mariana and Bremadino. She is an activist in the movement for mountains and waters of Minas Gerais. She is a PhD student at the Federal University of Minas Gerais doing research on the influence of mining in the education system. She is in Canada as a Queen Elizabeth Scholar at York University with a study grant that links research and activism. So without further ado, I welcome Judith Marshall. Good day to all of you, and uh, thank you for joining us in this conversation about mine tailings dam spills in the Americas. Mining companies are very good shape the way that we see mining in our lives, and powerful mining companies like Tech and Barrick and Valley do constant promotion of the mining narrative in-house. The mining industry is also set up think tanks like MAC and PDAC, in Canada and the London-based Council on Mining and Minerals, just to make sure that their message about what mining means is getting out to all of us. 
They employ multitudes of researchers, lobbyists, and publicists who work tirelessly to promote the prevailing narrative about mining. In a nutshell, their message is that mining is a vital necessity and we can't live without it. The Mining Association of Canada, for example, asserts that MAC and its members work with governments on policies affecting the sector and educate the public on the value mining brings to the economy and daily life of all Canadians. PDAC advocates for federal, provincial and territorial governments to put in place an enabling environment for companies, mining companies, to develop deposits of the minerals and metals that make modern life possible. PDAC uses its annual convention in Toronto every spring uh, to reinforce that message. Happily, activists, many of you with us on the, this webinar, once again found ways to disrupt the PDAC convention this year with imaginative actions both inside and outside. We need to keep shining a light on the behavior of mining companies and interrupt the corporate narrative whenever and wherever we can. The Kairos organizers asked Daniela and me to share with you how mining became so important to each of us. I expect that probably many of you who chose to join us this afternoon also have a mining community that you care about deeply. Uh, Daniela's and my paths were quite different uh, as the introducer, the introduction stated, um, she was born in a mining community in Brazil and some of the things that she'll share with us are the dilemmas of being a high school teacher and trying to promote critical thinking about mining in a mining community totally dominated by big mining companies. I myself have never lived in a mining community, but during my 20 years in the Global Affairs Department of the Steelworkers, issues related to mining kept coming my way. At a humanity fund meeting just after I started, a board member from the tech smelter in Trail told us that mining companies in BC were all packing their exploration equipment and heading to Chile. This was in 1992. He said his members wanted the union to help them understand why. And so we began to focus on Chile. We built a course called Thinking North South that tackled themes like globalization, trade agreements, and the power of transnational corporations. Uh, we promoted worker-to-worker -work exchanges with tech workers in Canada and in Chile and Peru, where tech had also bit, uh, had new projects. In 2006, uh, mining came my way again in a, in a big fashion because Brazil's mining giant Valley bought Inco's four nickel mining complexes, including those in Sudbury and Thompson. All of those complexes had strong local unions affiliated with the steel workers. Then came news that Valley had won the competition to develop coal mining in Mozambique, a country where I worked for eight years. So yet more reasons for me to pay attention to mining. Then in 2010, amidst prolonged strikes in three of the mining operations Valley had purchased um, from Inco, uh, Brazilian activists invited the steelworkers in Canada and other organizations here to attend a meeting about Valley in Brazil. This meeting brought 160 people from Valley operations in 14 countries together for the first time. They included trade unionists, environmentalists, social movements like the Landless People's Movement, rights organizations, indigenous activists, uh, researcher activists, and all recounted their stories of Valley's impact on their lives and communities. Out of that emerged the international articulation of men and women affected by Valley, um, an articulation that continues to this day. And this is how Daniela and I met, because in that first conference in Brazil, we did a pre-conference visit to Minas Gerais and hosted by her organization, uh, Movsam. Um, and so we met at that time and our paths keep connecting always around this question of mining. After my own retirement in 2014, I stayed active in the Valley Network, wearing a researcher hat linked to York University, and ended up writing several articles about tailing stem spills in Mount Polly and Mariana. Today, we're wanting to talk to you about mining, not within that mining company narrative uh, as an activity that creates jobs, economic growth, and makes modern life possible 
We want to explore with you mining as an activity at the center of the limitless industrial growth that's causing global warming. And we want to look at mining as an activity that creates a huge and destructive environmental footprint, even at the best of times. And in the worst of times, it's an activity prone to colossal disasters, such as the collapses of tailings dams, spilling toxic materials far and wide with huge losses of life and property. So in our process presentations today, uh, these conversations will take us in several directions. Um, as the slide indicates, we're going to look at um, tailings dam breaches in these three places, in Mount Pauly in 2014, in Mariana in 2015, and in Brumadinho in 2019. And then um, if we could see on the screen the other areas that we're going to talk about. Um, uh, we'll move from looking specifically at those three tailing dam collapses uh, to looking at the socio-environmental impact of those collapses. And one of the one of the vexing questions is who's affected um, and by something like a mine tailing dam collapse, which because the footprint is so big becomes uh, an event that encompasses many people far away from the mine site. And then we'll be looking at corporate and government responses to the collapses. Could we see that second slide, or is it the third one? Um, and finally, so. Um, looking at some of the responses from mining companies and governments um, to the collapses. And out of those responses, I think in both countries, the question has come up, what do we do when governments, in fact, fail to protect mining communities, miners themselves, the land, the water, the salmon? Who cares when something happens in a mining community? So that's roughly where we are. Um, we've kind of looked a little bit at mining in our lives. Now we'll turn to tailings dam collapses and whether these should be understood as an event or a process. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mine tailing dams collapsed before we actually look visually at what happened in Mount Pauly in 19, uh, 2014 with the collapse there. So. A mine's footprint is gigantic for many reasons, because the mine is not just the operations of ore extraction, an open pit or a maze of underground tunnels. A mining complex has many parts, including earth enclosures to store mine waste that are some of the largest man-made structures in the world. And then just to get to the ore body, there's a need to remove the overburden of trees, plants, and soil first. Uh, and then the rock around the ore body. And this involves crushers and smelters, uh, with introduction of chemicals to get at the marketable ore. So mining produces an enormous amount of waste, much of it made toxic through the extraction process. And since mining companies in this hyper-globalized world are all intent on getting resources to global markets, the footprint extends well beyond the mining complex and into transport routes, trucks, trains, ports, where there's specialized ore carriers. Uh, for example, in Brazil, in Maranhão, specialized ore carriers carrying iron from Brazil off to China. In Brazil, there are even ore pipelines with water flushing the ore from extraction site to ports. These tailing dams are complex engineering projects, earth enclosures that grow higher as extraction proceeds and they've become much more dangerous with global warming and intense weather events. In times past, it was probably relatively safe for an engineer to design tailings dam specifications based on precipitation patterns over the last 50 years. Today, with global warming, all bets are off about patterns of precipitation and seismic activity. So mining tailings dam storage areas are, are dangerous sites. In BC, when Mount Pauly collapsed, there were 123 active tailings dams in BC. And the most quoted statement from the expert panel appointed to investigate the Mount Pauly breach was the following. If the inventory of active tailings dams in the province remains unchanged and performance in the future reflects that, that in the past, then on average, there'll be two failures every 10 years and six every 30. So 
mining has always been dangerous. Mining tailings dams are a danger that we're perhaps duly aware of because of the increased frequency of tailings dam spills and certainly these three in the Americas, the largest of the recent tailings dam collapses in the world are all in the Americas, one in Mount Pauli and the two in Brazil and these are where we're going to uh, take you today to have a look at them. Um, so let's have a look at the video of Mount Pauli and what happened in the tailings dam belonging to Imperial Metals collapsed. social and environmental impacts of the Mount Pauli spill with those in Brazil, we do not have the dramatic consequences like those of Mariana where a toxic tsunami made its way for 10 days of destruction along the 600 plus kilometer Rio Doce River system through two states and finally arriving at the Atlantic Ocean. And we do not have the worst industrial accident in world history, killing 272 people that occurred at Brumadinho a few years later. At Mount Pauli, no lives were lost. No people were left homeless when the dam collapsed, spilling into Pauli Lake, the Hazeltine Creek, and Canal Lake, a pristine glacial lake and favorite site for ecotourism. All this notwithstanding, the social and environmental impact, impacts have been profound, although more dispersed both in time and place. The First Nations health the story authority study on the health impact made two years after the collapse allows an, an appreciation of the scope and the depth of the impact. First, the study identified the scope of the impact, making contact with 47 communities, of which 23 responded and became engaged in a participatory research project. The 22 Indigenous communities and one non-Indigenous community that responded were all located within the giant footprint created by the Mount Pauli Copper and Gold Mine. These communities stretched along the Fraser River system, a vitally important area for salmon. Canal Lake itself is the epicenter, which was the epicenter of the spill, plays a key role in the salmon spawning cycle, being the incubator of 20%, 25% of BC's endangered wild salmon. Yeah. 
three indigenous communities had their traditional territory directly affected. Uh, Shasso First Nation, also known as Soda Creek Indian Band, and the Tesomec, also known as Williams Lake Indian Band, were recognized immediately uh, by Imperial Metals and BC government as affected. Um, the Elishtak Dene First Nation was also one that lost traditional territory, but was not uh, immediately recognized. And the report, in fact, recommends that it be recognized as a community affected and have possibilities of, of uh, claims because of, of having been directly affected. There were also direct impacts on the one non-Indigenous community involved at, in a place called Likely, um, where the tailings dam entered Canal Lake and sank deep, uh, the, the, the toxic part sank deep into the central part of this uh, fjord-like body of water. The study that was done delved deeply into the economic, social, and cultural determinants of health in those 23 communities. And the kinds of impacts that people felt included changes in personal fishing practices, diet, ability to hunt, trap, fish, forage, and travel in, on their own land, access to traditional territory, fears over contaminated fish, land, and water, traditional cultural practices uh, curtailed, conflict, and violation of rights. Uh, the impacts on these small communities, and there were many of them, was largely invisible to the mining company and I venture to say after the week that Daniela and I spent in Williams Lake uh, in March of this year, I venture to say that the impact of the dam collapse on these small communities was probably pretty invisible to most of the general public too. Uh, Williams Lake is a bustling ranching, mining and tourism site in a beautiful part of the Caribou. Uh, but uh, the study really showed um, I was going to say the underbelly, that's not a, a, a happy choice of word, but got to the real scope of that spill and, and the many lives affected. The Northern Shushop National Tribal Council, of which Soda Creek and Williams Lake Bands are members, was actually finalizing a policy to govern mining in their territory when the collapse occurred. Jacinda Mack, whom some of you know, was the coordinator of uh, that project. Uh, both bands had signed impact benefit agreements with Mount Poly Mining Company. Uh, immediately after the collapse, um, the head of Mount Poly Mining Company was there in the community with the British Columbia Ministry of Energy and Mines at his side, and he told people that I'd drink the water. Strangely enough, that was also a comment made in Brazil after, after the, the Mariana collapse. Um, the level of distrust was very high, however, and, and Bev Sellers, then chief of the Chapsel Band, announced publicly that her community would use funds they had saved up for construction of a community center to hire an independent biologist to test the purity of the water. The health study two years later revealed that the 22 indigenous communities affected all reported decreases in individual fishing practices, all communities reported increased emotional stress, all spoke of an increase in administrative burden in dealing with community members faced with loss of the food source, loss of livelihoods, and complete absence of information. Neither mining company nor government issued regular news bulletins, leaving the communities awash with rumors. Since the Canal Lake watershed supports an important component of the Fraser River Sockeye Salmon Run, there were immediate concerns about long-term impacts on the movement of salmon from rivers to ocean and back to spawning grounds. Monitoring the impact of the toxic waste dumped into Quinell Lake became even more difficult when the Liberal government on the eve of elections, which they subsequently lost, granted Mount Polly a permit to continue dumping wastewater into Quinell Lake. Claims that it, claiming it was treated water and therefore safe were believed by very few people. So I'll ask for, there are just a few slides that picture Mount Polly again to show very briefly and then over to Daniela who will tell us more about living in a mining community in Brazil and the disaster of Mariana and Brumadinho. 
so here you see Polly Lake, Canal Lake, and Hazeltine Creek, and the area of the debris. There you can see where um, Mount Polly is located in the map of BC. Next, please. And once again, the aerial view of the extensiveness. As you can see with a mine, I mean, it's, when you go to a mine site, you don't think what would happen if that tailings down to collapse? Where would that go? What are the river systems, the watersheds in that area? But the aerial map picks up what happens. Again, just a little sense of the terrain, uh, the beauty of it, among the peacefulness of it, and, and the complete dis, uh, destruction of it with what happened with that tailing stem collapse. I think my face seems to hide a very beautiful salmon lurking in waters to the right, but perhaps you all can see it. So over to Daniela. So hello, it's, it's a very strong start, uh, these two videos, but it's very necessary start uh, because I will speak about uh, uh, 
things very strong, very hard. So I am Daniela Campolina. I am an activist and movement for the mountains for the in the water Minas Gerais. And um, this is one network and there are many uh, groups, many uh, activist groups and the work together. I am in the movement Salve Gandarela, Salve a Serra do Gandarela. And for many years I work, uh, have been work uh, in the one city and uh, there are many problems. Uh, in the cities, there are many tennis done, and it's very difficult uh, work about uh, in education and speak about mining in, and about uh, tennis done. So uh, this is my culture, Brazil. In Brazil, is a culture in rich in minerals. There are many kinds: aluminum, copper, manganese, uh, and specifically. Uh, there are more in the north and Amazonia region and in Minas Gerais state. Uh, here is, is my state and in this part is where I live. Uh, this place, this region, uh, the name is Aero Quadrilateral, uh, is the center of Minas Gerais state and consists of uh, um, 34, 35 cities and uh, include the uh, capital Belo Horizonte. Uh, this is one map and the uh, quadrilateral, aero quadrilateral, but the movement and the many reserves, many reserves speak this water aero quadrilateral because in this region there are one specificity. Uh, the high lines is brown lines uh, is the mountains uh, are the mountains but in the aero quadrilateral the water is together is between is between the aero uh, and aquifers uh, this part is uh, one aquifer is the hawk and this place the rainwater uh, is accumulated here together iron and uh, this uh, in this place, there are three uh, watershed. Uh, for example, Paropeba River Basin, uh, Rio das Velhas, uh, Velhas River Basin, and Dos River Basin. This color blue is because uh, there are many aquifers. And uh, uh, what more dark the blue, more water. So it's the very important place for the supply, the water uh, of the state, Minas Gerais state. And uh, so the mountains is the watersheds, is the vision three watershed. And this place, there are two mines, mines and tennis down. This is very problem because the, usually the tennis down is, tennis down is building um, above the rivers. And uh, with one, with your core, one collapse, the mud fluid uh, for the uh, for the river. So uh, out the tennis dam. Uh, this is the same map, but are the uh, these dots uh, are tennis dam. Yes, there are many tennis dam dams in Minas Gerais State. Uh, and this place specific is only aero quadrilateral. So it's around uh, 400 tennis down. And uh, look, look at the color and the size because this different color and the size is because it's different um, kites and the volume and metros cubics and the mud. It's possible to see in this legend the uh, they are big and biggest and uh, the light blue dots uh, are the tennis dome is above the one very important source water 
is the this part, this region is more population region of Minas Gerais State. And these dots is around 80 dots. We feel some of this tennis dome collapse. The more around the uh, um, millions people is 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 not have water. For example, tomorrow is possible, and this is very complicated because uh, this part, this uh, Hilda Hilda's Valley base is very important for the supply water, the social water, the capital. In this map is the same. IO quadrilateral and here is possible to see where is the Mariana city. Here is the first biggest uh, tennis dam collapse because there are many tennis dam occur in Brazil and in Minas Gerais, not only two, but this is the biggest. And the first of these is the Mariana city and uh, those river basin uh, is the crime uh, Samarco Valley in Beate de Billington and occurred in November 5, 2019, oh, sorry, 2015. And here, in here is uh, the second valley crime, crime in January 25, uh, 2019. And this lime brown is the, the way of mud, and the way is the river. And here, is the capital and I am live here. I live in the Rio das Velhas, uh, in Velhas River Basin. I live in near the Serra do Gandarela National Park. This is on one very important region, this region, uh, because many years fight, uh, we, uh, we have one park, but uh, one very part, one uh, important part this park is not together park. So uh, we, the movement for the mountains uh, and the water Minas Gerais and Serra do Gandarela movement fight uh, until today about uh, the preservate this area because with, um, with uh, we'll have one mining in this area is very, very, uh, uh, a big possibility, many people don't have more water in the, uh, in the next two years. And so I will speak about the first video, is the Cream of San Marco and Together Valley in BHP Billington. This crime is uh, around 40 million cubic meters, is the mud toxic, and that 90 people, uh, the, this is some images, and uh, and uh, many the extrusion of public infrastructure and private properties, uh, for example, houses, bridges, schools. And uh, this is very important because the mud, the mud follow for many kilometers. Uh, this uh, is for the, is in the, the way is the way of the river. So here start the collapse and the mud follow for the uh, watershed Dosi River and to uh, encroach to states, Minas Gerais State and Espírito Santo State and arrive in the ocean Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. So this is the road, the land, the mud is along uh, 600 kilometers, so there are many people affected. And there are many problems. Uh, one problem is the, wa the water shortage because there's enough affect the city, around the 40 city, uh, and the thousand people with the water, include the people who do not live near the river. And uh, so uh, this is affect many ways of living and economy, economic activities. Uh, for example, uh, the agriculture, 
this area, uh, the people living near the Rio Doce, uh, Sweet River, uh, the people is very simple people. And uh, many uh, live in the domestic and agri family agriculture. So your so uh, the hand the land and the water is contaminated. So there are many problems for the security uh, food, for example, and many people so live uh, living uh, to fishing or need the fishing for you for food too. And uh, this along the river there are many uh, uh, many cities with the uh, live and tourism and local commerce. So the tennis dam collapse uh, changed many, many lives. Uh, of course, more the, the family and your family is dead, but uh, this affected is, is many, many people along the many cities. So, it, but not all the economy, uh, we speak about the impact in social relation and the way of the live on the, for example, indigenous and traditional communities. These communities uh, live with the river and on the river. And, uh, and this is, is not simple. It's, it's very complex because it's complex include uh, identify this problem. This is one problem. Uh, but identify this is is complicated too, uh, and this and they are the extrusion of, uh, for example, uh, preservation areas. We pile on forests. It, this is the first around the river. This is very important for the ecosystems, and the destruction um, uh, long areas in Atlantic forest, and uh, we speak about. Uh, uh, big eco ecosystems and the uh, one river that Yatu is the name and the language uh, indigenous, Hyudus, the name of the river. And for the communities, this is uh, one that reef. And uh, is, the significance of this is, is very strong. And uh, the first time the, the mining company speaking is not, not toxic the mud. But yes, it's very toxic. So many studies in university speak about this. And uh, many diseases is in don't only physical, because physical diseases, they are, for example, because there are many, many kinds. But for example, gastrointestinal, dermatologic, is especially because they have metals. But there are two mental diseases. For example, uh, the consume of drugs, depression, suicides, and mental disease in many communities affected by collapse. And epidemic diseases, because the, the cash, the many ecosystems is destruction, and uh, it's very common some diseases, for example, uh, yellow fever, febre amarela is one kind, and the, they are one uh, transmission and don't have one animal for uh, eat this transmission. So the numbers, the ca cases, this diseases is more big after the, after the collapses. And this all problems is again, uh, some years after and the second crime valleys, valley crimes uh, occur in the 24 January in Brumadinho City and Paropeba River Basin. And you, uh, you can see the video. Uh, I don't know if you see, but in uh, last two minutes, the, the tennis dog collapsed. And uh, for example, the work is, uh, is not possible. Many works in this area. And uh, there was one restaurant above, uh, sorry, restaurant below uh, and very near 
the the uh, uh, thing is done. And this hour, in the hour of the collapse, uh, this is the hour of the hablash. So many works um, was in hablash in this hour. And here, uh, some uh, the very incredible, uh, very um, work in the fire and the uh, trying uh, found people. And until today, there are people is not miss. There are bodies disappearing. Uh, it's not possible uh, found some bodies today and uh, until today. And say, uh, similar, the mud followed the river and around, uh, around 300 kilometers. And this case uh, is one uh, river, is part that one big, big river in Brazil, São Francisco River. And this is very problematic because with one author, uh, things don't collapse, it's possible the mud uh, crawls for many, many states. And so it's very important to speak the, uh, the things don't collapse is not one event, it's one isolated event, it's one process, it's, it's one process is building. And for us, the, the, the word is very important because uh, the mining company speak of is one accident is not one accident, it's one crime. It's one crime and, and two crimes. And uh, this crime is start before the day of the collapse. The collapse. For example, this region, there are uh, mining dependence. Uh, this economy local is very is, is specialized, it's around the mining. And the question of the commodities, I believe uh, Judith is explaining more, more about this. And uh, the question of impunity, because uh, uh, in Brazil and in Canada, uh, it's possible uh, we now know uh, it, uh, there are very documents in the affirm the mining companies know is is not good the telling down, but uh, the government uh, permit the continue, and this is very problem. And here I put uh, because many things is only event, and uh, they are long term effects. So, for example, the toxic mud don't um, uh, the toxic mud stay and today in the river. This is, is very problematic. And the many people is dead and the co uh, contamination is possible. Many people will be dead too because uh, it's fish and uh, you accumulate the heavy metals and it's possible many people, there are many diseases and the death too and along the time. And uh, the question of the water contaminated and the destruction ecosystem is a long term. And the very problems, diseases, impact in the economy local, uh, all the problems is, is not simple, is not finishing. And uh, for us in Minas Gerais state, the tennis dump collapse is not, uh, is not stop, it's continued until today. So, uh, uh, this is one part of this very complex problem. And Judith now is speaking some things uh, about how the mining uh, corporation and how uh, the uh, government respond to the question uh, after the collapse. Okay, Judith. Judith, your your uh, is not possible. Your seu microfone está desligado. Yeah. How is that? Okay. Okay. Good. 
so as Daniela has, has said, uh, the mining companies tried to treat these collapses as just an incident, an accident, nobody's fault, uh, mm -hmm. um, treatable through some reparations of the damage and some compensation to people affected. But what both of us are arguing is that no, that they're not an event. They're a process that stretches both backwards and forwards with both deep roots and long-term consequences. Um, in terms of the kind of interlinking systems that created the conditions of these tailing dams collapses, I think we have to look at the realities of the world order that we're all part of today, where whether you're in the South as Brazil or the North as in Canada, uh, whether you're doing it through trade agreements or through structural adjustment programs, this way that uh, countries everywhere are now in a situation of following a common recipe of privatizations, deregulations, cuts in social sector spending, austerity, and all of them are in situations where the state has given predominance to the private sector as the engine for a global order based on perpetual economic growth. And so these tailings dams fit into that situation. There's the reality that in every country, if you go to Brazil, they're talking deindustrialization. The same in Canada, the same in South Africa. Everybody is doing export-oriented development. And so this takes us into commodities for global markets, mining, oil, uh, agricultural <clears throat> onocultures, and the booms and bust cycles, which were also a big feature of what caused the tailings dam spills. Mining companies trying to respond to uh, these huge um, shifts in the market. So looking at how all of this played itself out in the British Columbia, um, certainly the government of Christy Clark in power when Mount Polly collapsed had absolutely bought into its role as there simply to enable mining companies to operate in the province. Um, and in the aftermath of it all, uh, you, you can look back and see how many of these things kind of build up into the perfect storm. So the downsized governments that were part of this common recipe throughout the world meant that there was no longer a strong energy and mining ministry with qualified people in it to do inspections. Um, the companies had pushed for self-regulation and they got it. And they, the companies themselves could hire professionals to do the inspections of dams. But any consultancy company uh, hiring itself out to do this, those kinds of inspections, I mean, human nature being what it is, of course, they wanted future contracts. So, of course, the tendency to downplay problems that they encountered in their inspections was, was uh, enormous. And to start with, it was a kind of fox guarding the hen house kind of arrangement. Um, uh, so, certainly in BC, there were reports uh, in 2010 and 2011 that were not acted on. Uh, there was a point when one of the mine workers blew the whistle and himself wrote letters to the Ministry of Energy and Mines, uh, but he was fired for his trouble. Um, the, uh, at the Mount Pauli mine, the a person in charge of the tailings dam had requested um, some additional construction materials to shore up something in the mine. It, it was a, a a bus cycle, not a boom cycle. So the company was cutting back and cutting back on further investments in a tailings dam, which is not something that creates revenue for you, but it's just an expense. All these things resulted in the kind of perfect storm. Um, and interestingly enough, at the time when the Mount Pauli mine collapsed, the BC auditor was doing um, an audit on compliance and enforcement in the mining sector. She had actually, she says in her preamble that recognizing that with the collapse of commodity prices, many mining companies were struggling um, to survive. And her concern was to ensure uh, continued protection of British Columbia environment, whether the market was in a boom or a bust cycle. It would be hard to get a more scathing report than the one that she made um, 
She pointed to flagrant conflicts of interest where you have a government in which the same government ministry is in charge of promoting mining uh, and doing all that it can to attract more investments into mining and is responsible for regulating mining and ensuring the safety of workers, communities, the salmon, etc. Um, so her main uh, recommendation after this very thorough audit, because she turned her attention on Mount Pauly once it happened, um, her main recommendation was to tackle that flagrant conflict of interests. And she urged British Columbia government to set up an independent body uh, that would be um, mandated um, to carry out compliance and enforcement in the mining sector and to ensure environment protection. Um, and she urged that this not be housed in the Ministry of Energy and Mining. So a very strong recommendation, <laughs> along with 17 other recommendations that were uh, not as pointed as that one was. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the Christie Clark government um, at the end of its term in office uh, did not take up her recommendations. But the interesting thing is that the government that did form uh, with the NDP and Green Party in 2018 elections, which had been so critical of the former government at every step of the way, and yet that central recommendation from their own auditor was something that they also uh, simply, uh, well, simply did not mention. It wasn't that they refused to do it. It just never came up on the agenda. They tackled a few things like, like uh, these professional consultants, but the central recommendation that would have tackled that conflict of interest and um, really put government again into the seat of being the regulator and then not the enabler uh, for mining companies was something that they shied away from. So I'm seeing the time going. Danielle and I are both passionately interested in mining and we both talk a lot and we've talked a lot this afternoon. So I think we would like to open this up to some questions from those of you who have uh, tuned in and we'll see um, how we go with quest questions and any final little statements that Daniela and I, and I might make. So we got a couple of questions up so far. Um, I'll just read it in English and then I'll try my very best to read it in Portuguese as well. Uh, so for the first question, uh, hello Judith, hello Daniela, question for Judith. How did Canadian mining companies deal with those affected by the Mount Pauly Dam breach? Uh, so pergunta para Judith, como as empresas de mineração, o que é que eles fizerem para as pessoas afetadas uh, pela barragem? Você percebi? And yeah, in in Brazil. Uh, okay. e, e Or, você pode falar em the, Brazil. Both. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in Brazil, uh, uh, there are one. Uh, I, I will in Portuguese. Okay. <laughs> no Brasil tiveram assessorias técnicas, mas que não funcionam bem. São grupos técnicos que teoricamente deveriam apoiar a, as comunidades que fazem um trabalho nesse sentido. E tivemos muitos problemas com relação aos acordos, porque a empresa não, não reconhece todas as pessoas que realmente foram afetadas. E até hoje, por exemplo, vou só dar um exemplo sobre isso, não tem uma pessoa em Mariana que está em casa própria. E em Brumadinho, uh, também, as assessorias não, iniciar, é, não iniciaram o trabalho em campo. Então, ou seja, essas pessoas não estão sendo cuidadas. Não, 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 a palavra não é cuidado, porque isso não é um favor, né? Isso, elas não estão sendo ressarcidas como deveriam ser. Né? Então, a gente está falando que o afetamento ele vai muito além... Uh, é claro que o mais forte é o fato de perder uma pessoa pelo rompimento. Isso, assim, não, não tem palavras para descrever, mas existem várias formas de ser afetado. E a empresa não reconhece essas várias formas de ser afetado. Um, 
So just to kind of summarize yeah. what she said, um, there are lots of technical groups kind of assessing um, post the, the dam collapse, um, and they didn't recognize all the affected people, um, and people weren't being taken care of, and they weren't getting what they deserved, both in Bermudino as well as Ma in Mariana. I don't know if, Judith, you wanted to jump in and, and uh, give your view on um, in, in British Columbia? Yes, I mean, the, in British Columbia, I was not at the epicenter of this when it happened. So I, from what I have been able to understand, uh, first of all, I mean, compared to Brazil, you didn't have the loss of lives, of houses, of property, um, of animals that obviously cried out for compensation in the way that you did in Brazil. Um, this study that I was quoting um, was the most comprehensive I've seen in terms of really capturing uh, the scope of, of the collapse in terms of how many uh, Indigenous communities were affected. But most of them, uh, I mean, it, most of those affected by the collapse um, were not immediately affected in the sense of their 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 actual land um, being affected by the spill. A lot of the effects are long-term ones. The salmon cycle, for example, which is both um, a provincial uh, issue in in the sense of salmon as an a, an enormously important resource of BC, but. Um, salmon as the center of the cultural and religious life of indigenous people in that area and also a staple in their lives in terms of their food source so so the many many people but I mean even even uh, for them to have a, an avenue to request compensation for those damages they're way down river I mean, this is a question that Daniela, Daniela and I were talking about a lot, that like this huge footprint of mining, that it isn't just what happens in the immediate mine site. So many of these communities are sprinkled all along the Fraser River. And to the degree that this tailing dam spill um, interrupts the salmon, salmon cycle along that river, it's food sources, it's livelihoods, but of large numbers of people and individual compensation claims, not so much. Now, some of the people in Likely, uh, the, the community closest to the spill, uh, apparently have carried out some private actions. There were lots of small fishing lodges, tourism ventures, small business ventures uh, there, and, and some of them have had individual compensation for the company. But from what I've been able to glean, that's kind of what it looks like in terms of, of compensation claims. Perfect. Thank you, Judith. There was also a question kind of going off of the long-term effects. Um, was there also mercury poisoning and other metals that poison drinking water and cause, cause birth defects later on uh, in children that were born afterwards? Um, Yes, the, it's about the Maria Lopes. Ele está perguntando se os químicos que estavam na água se impactou as crianças que nasci depois. Se alguma coisa acontecer com essas crianças que nasci depois. Yeah, uh, the problem is, is very complex, but there are some studies uh, about more about the uh, uh, Rio Doce River because there are more time. Uh, for example, uh, this is one publication, uh, Mar de Lama da Samarco, uh, do Rio Doce. This publication is uh, one university, Manuel Zão project, and there are many studies about this. But this is one very long effect, uh, long-term effect. Many things is, is important continuous studies about this, but it's set, but certainly the heavy metals the, have many impacts of the health and this uh, heavy metals stay in the river. So this is one problem because the people 
drink the water the people eat the fish is possible in some place and this is is a very problem not only the children but for the people and all age yeah but i can for example after send some studies about specific about this but don't only uh, children it's all age there are problems because the heavy metal is very problem yeah in the uh, sick and the health yeah um judith did you have anything to add there i believe it is is uh, uh, uh there are some questions here mm -hmm. and uh, i believe i and judith uh, sure. uh reply in the next next two uh, block. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Yep. And uh, uh, I, I, Judith, you can speak some things about this this part, or I can continue. I think you were going to speak first to some final words. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gabriela, do you know? Do you? Can you put the? Yeah, please. Uh, so about many, uh, there are many questions about how, uh, uh, what is the possibility, uh, what things is possible make, because it's very complicated, uh, the government is very complicated, the actions, the mining company is not possible, uh, believe the mining company is not possible to believe the government and uh, uh, you can put the first slide please uh, can you put the first slide please ah thank you and in the question how civil sources step up and uh, for example uh, the first thing is very important uh, the people think about ways to be affected uh, where does your water come from, your fish, your food? Even if it, uh, you are not on the mud route and can be affected by collapse disaster because um, uh, two big collapse, Brumadinho, and not only Brumadinho, but more strong in Brumadinho, but in Paropeba River Basin and in Mariana City, but along many cities too, uh, Many people don't know uh, uh, there are one uh, tennis dam and tennis dam and one mine uh, below your head. And uh, for example, many, many, along many, many kilometers. And only after one big impact, many big impact, the people know. So it's very, very important one uh, population and know what, what is, is uh, the problem, what's the possibility uh, I, can, I can affect it by mining, I can affect it by mud, because it's possible one people uh, live uh, far the river, but will be affected too. Is the case, for example, uh, the people in the have your system, uh, the supply water uh, is, is stopping because this is very complicated. And uh, it's very important to know what the decision making process is like, who they see, how do they decide, what are the steps. Uh, in Canada, in Brazil, it's different. Um, laws but it's very important the people know what's the way of the actions the last please the next next uh, yeah and so it's very important too i i am a teacher so i live in many years the many problems about the question the money and influence in school so it's very important training and empowerment the communities uh, and scholar education, but popular education too. Uh, for example, I and my friends, teacher, 
there are many problems because I don't have materials, course specific. I and my friends, for example, many times uh, did course uh, make for uh, for many companies because they are one partnership with this uh, education uh, manager. This is very complicated. And it's very important in school and communities as technology produces. For example, uh, how is mud work? What are the types of the dams? Uh, what's the forms of monitoring? monitoring? Uh, make the collection and the monitoring information. Uh, it's similar one adopt of mining or adopt things down because it's one community uh, look at all, all the moment for the uh, how is the tennis down because the stain down is above my hair this is, is very complicated so this in this image is some example about this this possibility um, activities uh, didactics with this. This is in Gandarela. This region is very important. Uh, the question of the water is uh, very one conflict because the mine. The last, please. Next, please. And uh, it's very important to uh, make one visibility of disaster. In many, uh, for example, demonstration, protests, and major event and important place. Uh, for example, uh, this many photos is photos is one demonstration block, <coughs> one and trace. Oh, sorry. <coughs> and the Minas Gerais assembly. <coughs> and this is one PDAC. I'm sorry. <laughs> And PIDAC demonstration is one big event <clears throat> in Canada uh, about mining. And uh, this is one demonstration with the group, the Resistencia Toronto, Resistance Toronto, make one many uh, lines, red, red step, with the name, the people dead of the mine. For example, this is one example. And uh, they have the name, the people, that, and the collapse. For example, this name is Edmar Salles. And there are people, women too. And this is one form, the, the in big events uh, and all place, the, they are one visibility of the disaster. It's, not, uh, it's very important, don't forget this situation. Yeah, and I believe you did speak so uh, too about some uh, questions in Canada too. This is some examples in Brazil and the, the question um, in tennis dam collapses, but the questions the produce and materials about the the region is very important too. And Judith, do you uh, you can continue? in Canada, the questions? Okay, I can do so. Okay. Um, yeah. in very quickly, since time is running out on us. Um, I, clearly, this need to step up from civil society. This is a theme in both countries. Um, when governments are not doing what they should be doing uh, to regulate and defend, how do civil society organizations step up and take on new roles. And uh, clearly they're interesting and important initiatives in both countries and Canada, I think very important initiatives through universities, good things happening uh, through, through various projects, looking at corporate uh, responsibility and, and uh, also many smaller organizations that responded both to Mount Pauli, but also carry on important activities in relation to any number of questions, mining being among them. One of the special evenings when we were in British Columbia a few, in March was with the Council of Canadians there in Kamloops, a mining town for sure. 
and uh, in that evening with people from the Council of Canadians and Kamloops, um, Danielle and I, who had the day before visited the, the mine, visited the tailings dam, uh, gone to Ashcroft where there are trains bringing coal from northern BC and copper from uh, Kamloops, uh, putting it on the trains, getting it to ports, export markets, that whole globalized world of mining. But people living knowing that tailings dams and their collapses are getting more frequent and not less. And so a fascinating evening with people there where at one point, the 20 or so people who came uh, chatted in small groups and we asked them, well, just think about your own community. Have you ever visited the tailings dam? Do you know how big it is? Do you know what toxic materials are in it? Uh, if it were to breach, what are the waterways around Kamloops that it would revert to if, if that were to happen? Um, does the mining company have an emergency plan? Uh, if it does, is it a plan that's known to people in the community? Is there an emergency warning system? Are there drills? Um, I mean, these, uh, if you get close to mining tailings, dams collapses uh, in other parts of the world, these are not uh, questions that come just from people who are hyper anxious. Tailings dam spills are increasing in frequency and anybody living in the proximity of a mine and a tailings dam really needs to be thinking about this. So uh, we were laughing about it saying, oh, kind of an adopt a mine policy. But th is this kind of citizen vigilance around a mine and a mine's tailings dam really what the situation demands in this day and age? Um, so I'll just close with that and maybe leave you with four thoughts about mining activism. Um, first, I think we just need to take regular recapture as a given and start from there. And second, we really need to keep our eyes in whatever we do on the corporations and shine a light on their actions, whether it's their lobbying actions or whether it's the discourse they use to wield their power. And third, we look to, need to look for places, whether it's in churches or in universities or in our communities, where there are trusted voices asking critical questions uh, about mining and work to enlarge those spaces. And, and, um, and finally, uh, we, I think we don't measure our success necessarily by what we achieve, but what we become and really joining up with other people in our communities, in our countries, internationally, uh, like this action around Brumadinho, which brought tears to my eyes when I saw all those uh, red ribbons with names of every person who died in Brumadinho down on Front Street in Toronto for the PDAC event. Um, what we become as we work in solidarity, trying to care for each other and care for the earth in, in, in new ways that uh, respond to the urgent issues of our times. So I think we've used most of the time. I don't know if there's time for more questions, but over to our hosts to let us know. Perfect. Um, I think we'll just about wrap up. Um, I know that um, Daniela and I'm sure Judith have no problem um, uh, with answering the questions that were posted there um, through their email or such. So we'll get back to you on that. Um, but there are some actions that you can take if you'd like to make a difference. Uh, so in 2018, Canada was promised an ombudsperson with investigatory powers. Um, but in 2019, the government receded this promise and left the core with the inability to investigate human rights abuses connected to Canadian companies operating abroad. Uh, with these, without these crucial investigatory powers, the ombudsperson cannot address the countless human rights and environmental violations that communities across the globe uh, allege that Canadian extractive uh, companies operating abroad have committed. Canadian companies and the extractive companies like Valley and Brazil uh, are very often not held accountable for their misconduct, such as tailings dam collapses. Uh, with this, I urge you to sign the e-petition to empower the core and enact mandatory human rights due diligence legislation to the House of Commons. Uh, the link is going to be added to the chat now. Uh, after you sign this, uh, I consider taking the empower and enact challenge. So use social media uh, to encourage five people to sign the e-petition. 
So on behalf of Kairos and myself, I'd like to thank Judith and Daniela for joining us today uh, and telling us their inspiring stories. Uh, as a reminder, Kairos will be posting this recording on their webinar uh, of this webinar on their website in the coming days. Uh, the next webinar in the Mother Earth and Resource Extraction webinar series takes place on Tuesday, June 2nd at 1 p.m. Um, this webinar uh, called Women Resisting Extractivism is being hosted by the Just Sweet Forum for Social Faith and Justice and co-sponsored by Kairos. And the registration link is also being shared in the chat now. Uh, lastly, remember to visit the Mirror Hub and follow Mirror Hub's social media pages, which are also being added to the chat. Um, so thank you everyone for coming uh, and have a good afternoon.